Hello and good morning. Welcome to our morning worship today, the 1st of May. Uh, this service is brought to you by St. Thomas of Beckett Church, Ramsey. My name is Ian Osborne, the Rector of the Church. Today, in our Bible reading, we're going to hear about radical change. We're in the Sundays after Easter, aren't we? And our Bible readings tell us, first of all, about the various encounters that people had with the risen Lord. Slightly mysterious meetings where people don't recognize a man they knew really well, where Jesus comes and goes like a disembodied spirit and yet isn't. You can touch him. He sits down and eats breakfast with you. But alongside those stories of encounter, we also hear the narrative of what happens next through a series of readings from the Acts of the Apostle, or Apostles. That is to say, well, the resurrection, fine, but so what? What does it mean? What does it do? What change has it brought about? So we have these series of stories about radical, rapid change. Today, we hear about a life transformed by the impact of the resurrection. We'll come to that in a moment. Let's begin our worship with a prayer. And then we'll sing our first hymn. Let us pray. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. come to our Bible reading, uh, but as I read, I'm going to offer you an image to look at. Actually, it's the first of two paintings. They're both um, 17th century Italian painters. Uh, this is by Luca Giordano. The reading, the story in the reading is the conversion of St. Paul, the road to Damascus experience. And I think this image wonderfully brings out the, the drama the violence even of God's intervention in Paul's life. Here they read the first part of the reading. Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Now, as he was going along and approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were travelling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And now here's an image of the second half of the story. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Je Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. As I said earlier, this story shows us the impact of the resurrection. The resurrection is, first of all, an event in Jesus' own life. But then, because of who Jesus is, it's an event in the world, in world history. It's like a stone dropped into a pool. But unlike the ripples when you drop a stone into a pool, it doesn't get smaller and die away as it propagates. The opposite is true. It gets more powerful. The rest of the book of Acts tells how the ripples spread out across the whole world to the centre of the empire. Acts tells a story over 20 years or so. Over the following 200 years or so, the resurrection upended the whole of a world empire, transforming the moral outlook and the lives of millions of people. One of the problems I have, uh, I think we all have sometimes in hearing properly a story like that, is the difficulty we have getting past our ideas about religion as a, as a category. We, we tend to hear the Bible or, or sermons as a contribution to thoughts about this thing called religion. And the message has to fit in to that framework. To our understanding of what religion is. It gets channeled and reduced. Uh, one of the most important ideas we have about religion is that it's somehow about changelessness, about being connected to eternity, 
participation in things that are ancient, using ancient forms of words, sitting in buildings erected many centuries ago. And none of that is entirely wrong. Certainly, if we understand religion as a cultural category, these are probably true and correct perceptions of religion. They do describe religion as a hobby or a pastime. As a framework for understanding the gospel, for understanding the impact of the resurrection, all this is deeply misleading. The single most important thing about the resurrection is that it causes things to change. And it doesn't just change um, things that are inward or personal. It changes the world. Now, I don't know how you feel about change in general. Some people don't have a particular view on change in general. It depends whether a particular change is good or bad. But some people have a general orientation sometimes to change, to like change. More often to dislike it, change does, uh, coping with change does in general require from us energy and effort. And many people tend to think that change is often mainly for the bad. Certainly if you followed the news, you would be inclined to think that things are in general getting worse, that the world is going to hell in the proverbial handcart. Actually, while some change is for the worse, lots and lots of things are getting better. I wanted to show you a few pages from a, a website that I rather love. It's called ourworldindata.org. And if you're at all curious about the world we live in, it's a brilliant resource for getting past this week's media sensation and away from the general unreasoning pessimism that often uh, soaks through the news agenda actually know what's happening in the world. Just a few snapshots. First, some data about child mortality, the proportion of children uh, who are born alive but then die before they're five years old. This is a graph that starts 70 years ago and shows how the, um, the proportion has changed over time. It, it's animated, so just watch this. Massive and hugely encouraging progress. There's more to do, of course, but things are not getting worse. They're getting better in this area. The second one about poverty. The proportion of people who are living in extreme poverty, that's below $1.90 a day. Just think about how little money that is. Again, a sign of progress. Let me animate it. Things getting better in almost all parts of the world. Um, China, we all know that China has made a big amount of progress in dealing with poverty, but it's not just China. It's almost everywhere. Even sub-Saharan Africa, which is the part of the world where there is most still to do, nevertheless has seen real impact. Um, people often don't understand this. They don't know it. Let me show you a, another graph. Which shows the results of an opinion poll here in the UK a couple of years ago. Question, in the last 30 years, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has, most people thought it had increased or remained more or less the same. We are soaked in pessimism, which is not justified by reality. One more. And this seems very topical as we are um, hearing every day about deaths in, in a terrible war um, in Ukraine. This shows that deaths per 100,000 of population over the last um, 70 odd years. And what it shows us is that the number of people dying in wars is broadly speaking going down and down. 
Um, it's interestingly, this is not because there are fewer wars. Um, it's because the wars uh, that happen tend to be less lethal. There are actually more wars than there used to be, but they're much less lethal. So as a share of population, um, they are less bad. I hope you found those snapshots interesting. Um, I, I think it's worthwhile combating the sense, the general sense that the world's going to hell in a handcart because it's not compatible with the idea that God is in charge. But you might nevertheless be wondering, why is the vicar showing us graphs about child mor mortality or poverty or war ca casualties? What has this to do with Christianity? If you are wondering that, then you've fallen into the religion trap I mentioned or thinking that the impact of the resurrection is mainly to do with out of time issues, with subjective, invisible things. But it isn't so. There is nothing in what Jesus says or does about himself that uh, should lead us to pigeonhole him that way. Let's get back to St. Paul. We really need to hear the story of how Paul, a God worked in Paul's life, life as an illustration of how God works in lives in general. God is loving. He isn't always gentle. Paul had deep soul, had deeply committed himself to a mistake, to a dead end set of choices that harmed others and that were shriveling up his soul. Changing this, took a dramatic intervention. For Saul, grace involved being knocked to the ground, being struck blind. It involved a rehabilitation process after the reading we heard today that took years. Are we willing to hear this? It really poses a question about what we expect of God. Are you really committed to the idea of being converted, to the idea of change, that your personality will change under the pressure over time of the Holy Spirit living within you, that you will drop not only trivially bad habits, but also whole ways of life that lead you away from God, that you will become a visible sign of God's kingdom, which means you will also become a scandal to the people who reject that kingdom, to becoming poorer when that means becoming more like Christ. Or perhaps are you actually deeply committed to the idea that nothing very dramatic is going to change, to the sense that really the world is going to hell in a handbasket, that things are getting worse, your main goal is really to insulate yourself from all of that. Do you really want God to shine his light on you? Which means turning your life topsy-turvy. Do you really want to be given new sight, a new name, a new life? As you think about that, I'll play an anthem. This joyful Easter time, this is sung by the St. Martin Singers.
We say our prayers of intercession now. <laughs> After each petition, please, uh, I'll say we pray to the Father. Please respond. Hear our prayer. In joy and hope, let us pray to the Father. That our risen Saviour may fill us and our town of Ramsey with the joy of his glorious and life-giving resurrection. We pray to the Father, hear our prayer. That isolated and persecuted churches may find strength in the good news of Easter. We pray to the Father, hear our prayer. That God, God may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That he may provide for those who lack food, work or shelter, particularly for refugees. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. That by his power, war and famine may cease through all the world, particularly in Ukraine. We pray to the Father, hear our prayer. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak and the dying, to comfort and strengthen them. We pray to the Father, hear our prayer. That according to his promises, all who have died in the faith of the resurrection may be raised on the last day. We pray to the Father, hear our prayer that he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, so that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection. We pray to the Father. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that, as his death has recalled us to life, so his continual presence in us may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sing now our final hymn, Love's Redeeming Work is Done. close with a blessing. God, who through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ has given us the victory, give you joy 
and peace in your faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Have a lovely Sunday.